So today's video was requested in my comment section and I was so pleasantly surprised because in my real life nobody cares about why my favorite book is my favorite book but shout out to the person who commented asking me to make a video about why I love The Secret History, The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I think it is one of my top five favorite books. There are a lot of things I love about this book and keep in mind I'm also the kind of person that was just destined to love this book. I mean I'm not saying I, I enjoy it more than anybody else. I'm saying that I might be overselling it because I'm obsessed with it. There are like a couple of main reasons why I love this book which I wrote down. Number one is language. Number two is the story and what it's based on. And three is just the overall sensationalism. <laughs> sensationalism. I've read it three times, listened to it as an audiobook once, and I always get the same feelings when I read it. And the more I read it, I get moved at different parts and new things jump out at me. So it's definitely a book that I will be rereading yearly for the rest of my life. Number one is language. When I say this book is concise, I don't mean that she is saying things in a simple manner, saying them quickly, no. The book is dense, it's 500 pages, and it's this beautiful thin paper with this gorgeous font, but the language is dense but not fatty. It's like every single word, every single word is needed to communicate the beautiful scene that she's painting for you and the array of emotions that are being felt by the narrator. But it's never redundant. I have an example right here. This part is Richard, the narrator, describing what he, describing what he finds so attractive about the Greek students and the Greek teacher, Julian, he says on page 31 of this paperback edition, I envied them and I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> I envied them and found them attractive. Moreover, this strange quality, far from being natural, gave every indication of having been intensely cultivated. It was the same, I would come to find, with Julian, though he gave quite the opposite impression of freshness and candor. It was not spontaneity, but superior art which made it seem unstudied. Studied or not, I wanted to be like them. Like, you know exactly what she means, except if somebody told you to explain what she meant, you would never write it that way. It's just brilliant. I have, I don't know what else to say. So number two, the story and its influences. First, of course, Donna Tartt is very inspired by the Bacchae, Bacchae. The play by Euripides from like 450 BC. At the end of the play, King Pentheus is ripped apart by the women of Thebes who have been driven mad by Dionysus as a punishment for rejecting Dionysus as like divinity and as somebody of importance entering his city. And his mom has his head on a stick and brings it to his father and she doesn't realize until the end that she has killed her own son. So that story alone, it is really one of the greatest tragedies of all time. So for her to draw her inspiration from that alone already sets the tone for what this book is going to be like. And I like the fact that in a Greek tragedy, there is almost always a prologue. And in this book, she has a prologue. On the first page, you find out that a student is killed by his classmates. It's written from the perspective of one of the students who was there, who is kind of like the outsider of the bunch, and it doesn't make the story any less exciting. It makes it even more exciting as you try to wait and see why is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? She really manipulates the story to enhance the, the plot that she's working towards, and it is just through and through a perfect story. There's a lot of just exploration of how emotions develop after a crime like this has been committed and how friendships change, relationships change, people change when something this tragic has occurred. Premeditated, by the way. Um, and the other thing that I love about this is the real life inspiration that she took to write this book. And if you don't know the lore, listen to Lily Analix, Once Upon a Time at Bennington, 
podcast that's everywhere on Spotify and such and then you could also check out her Esquire piece titled The Secret Oral History of Bennington, the 1980s Most Decadent College. Among the druggies, rebels, heirs, and posers, future Gen X literary stars Donna Tartt, Brett Easton Ellis, and Jonathan Lethem. What happened over the next four years would spark scandal, myth, and some of the author's greatest novels. So not only is the campus and the setting of the secret history based on real life Bennington College, like I think I've mentioned in previous videos, the people of the story are also based on reality, even if Donna Tartt claims that they are not. They are because Lily Analek sat and interviewed the real Bunny Corcoran, the real Henry Winter. Their voices sound exactly how they are described in the book. They look how they are described in the book. Their personalities are how, or kind of how they are described in the book. And you kind of see that Donna herself was the outsider observing in on her boyfriend, Paul McGloin's Greek class with a professor who is even more enigmatic than Julian Morrow is even described as in the book. A quote here from this other student not related to the novel said, Claude was my advisor. I had an appointment with him and I was waiting outside his office and the first thing I heard Claude say was, not do only what is necessary, only do what is necessary. And that is almost word for word in The Secret History. His office is described the same as Julian's right down to all of the beautiful fragrant flowers that he has everywhere. So. Yeah, I could keep talking about that, but I'm not going to because I already fell down that rabbit hole. But basically, I just find that super interesting and it makes the story even more authentic feeling. Um, even though nothing near what happens in the secret history happened in real life, the kinds of people and the lives that they lived do feel real to the time. Something else, number three, that I love is the sensations that you get when you read this book. It's a roller coaster of emotion. You kind of need to read it a few times, honestly, to feel everything I, that, that you need to feel. Richard is the outsider. He's an unreliable narrator. We already heard that he wanted to be just like these students. And their bond really is in, in the classics and in Greek. And it kind of provides this setting that only they are existing in. They're in the middle of this campus in 1980 and are not behaving like any of the other students and Richard realizes at the end like wow I've been stuck like with this group of people that I don't even know trying to live a life that I didn't even know that I wanted to live and I've kind of denied myself the social interactions and all the experiences that come with college by choosing to be in this group. And here from page 200, he says, how can I make you see it? The strange harsh light which pervades Homer's landscapes and illumines the dialogues of Plato, an alien light, inarticulable in our common tongue. They too knew this beautiful and harrowing landscape, those stern and ancient rhythms. So yeah, basically they all kind of have this permanently altered view of the world and are just existing in that cold, ancient landscape that kind of gives a chill to the whole book and it makes you feel like not only is the story sinister, but the reason why what is done is done and why it is excused within themselves is like so guided by ancient morals, ancient principles, and you see this at the end. Um, I'm about to spoil the end when Henry shoots himself. Um, he sees himself as a tragic hero. He sees it as his duty to end his own life, to save his friends, and he did not need to die, but he did need to die in order for this book to give that resonating feeling that it gives when you finish reading it. And I don't know, maybe when I read it a couple more times, I will hate Henry, but I still forgive him. I still love his character and their way of life was always appealing to me when I was reading this. I loved just hearing about them lounging around, smoking cigarettes, reading, going to Francis's house in the country 
and spending days just being drunk on a picnic, playing in the grass. And I think Vermont is just the perfect setting for it all. And I just want to go so badly to Bennington at least once just to see like what that shade of green is like in real life, you know? So I hope I've explained the main reasons why I love this. And it is just the perfect book for me. It's the writing that I like. I love classics. I'm interested in antiquity, Greece. I was born to be a Henry Winter defender, and yeah, I hope people keep reading it for years to come, and I hope and I pray that we get another Donna Tartt book this year, or else I don't know what I'm going to do. So yeah, that's why that's my favorite book. <laughs>